one life is all we have, and we live it as we believe in living it. But to sacrifice what you are and to live without belief, that is a fate more terrible than dying. Joan of Arc was under the age of 20 when she led the French to triumph in the war known as the Hundred Years' War. Joan disguised herself as a man, leading the troops to a victorious win. She was eventually captured by the English, and after an unfair trial, was sentenced to burned at the stake. The threat of her legacy and name was so powerful that she was burned not once, but three times. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Yet more than ashes did survive, as today, the legacy of Joan endures the minds of humanity. Joan was born a peasant at Domremy in northeast France on January 6th. Her full name was Jeanne d'Arc. She preferred to go by the title Jeanne la Cousselle, or Maid of Orleans. She and her family remained loyal servants to the rule of France, although they were surrounded by pro-Burgundian lands. The Burgundians were people from the neighboring and smaller kingdom of Burgundy. Her village suffered multiple raids, and on one such raid, it was burned. It wasn't until she reached the age of 13, however, that Joan had her first contact with what lays beyond. Starting from the age of 13, Joan began to have visions. In these visions, she felt the voice of God. These visions were often accompanied by a flash of light and the presence of other saints such as Saint Michael. God commanded her to restore the nation of France to its former glory. The voice told her to take a vow of abstinence and revealed itself gradually to her. It wasn't until May 1428 that Joan was no longer in doubt that she was meant to go to the king and assist him in the war. The voices became more insistent, urging her to go to Robert Baudricourt, and Baudricourt was rude and scorned her. The voices had also told Joan that she must lead Charles VII to his coronation at Reims. Two visits to Baudricourt later, Joan was grudgingly allowed to be tested by the court. After a vigorous examination, Joan became the youngest person in recorded history to lead the armies of a nation at the age of 17. Joan carried a banner with an image of God and the words, Jesus Mary, written on it. Joan and her soldiers reached Orleans on April 29, 1429. Even the simple act of Joan's presence proved to be exhilarating for the French and as equally demoralizing for the English. The battle raged on for days and considerable lives were lost on both sides. By May 8, 1429, the English were in full retreat. On May 5th, she sent a final ultimatum to the English during a self-imposed truce in honor of the Feast of Ascension. You, men of England, who have no right to this kingdom of France, the King of Heaven orders and notifies you through me, Jean the Maiden, to leave your fortress and go back to your own country, or I will produce a clash of arms to be eternally remembered. Joan had predicted that she would be wounded in the exact manner that she was, an arrow shot in her breast at Le Torel. She returned later to inspire the demoralized troops for one final effort. This decision proved to be decisive, as the English abandoned the siege the next day. Never again would the English come that close to a final victory against Charles. Joan and her troops continued on their way. She encountered trouble at Troy, and it took great effort to convince the army to continue. Even after successfully capturing Troy, they were still reluctant as they followed her to Reims where Charles VII was crowned on Sunday, July 17, 1429. Now that Joan's sole purpose had been achieved, there are some who say that she was anxious to return home, but that she was held in the army against her will. Joan cheered on her men as they filled the moat, but she was shot through the thigh with a bolt fired from a crossbow, and the attack was abandoned. Soon after this, a truce was signed through Charles's political counselors, and she regretfully laid down her arms on the altar of Saint Denis. The aborted mission had severely damaged her prestige. Joan spent the following winter surrounded by the jealousy of the court. On May 24th, Joan and her troop of about 500 set out for Comnie to defend the town against the Burgundian attack. She and the rest of her men fought valiantly, but the mistake was made by Guillaume de Flavy, who left a drawbridge still raised while many members of Joan's sortie, including Joan herself, remained outside and were captured by the English. After pulling her off her horse, they recognized almost immediately who she was, and Joan was quickly taken into captivity. It was during her capture with the English that the infamous trial of Joan of Arc was held. Charles VII had tried to threaten the Burgundians to return Joan in exchange for a ransom. However, these attempts to rescue Joan were failed, and the Burgundians refused to ransom her. 
Joan tried to escape twice while imprisoned, resulting in her being moved from location to location several times. Joan of Arc was tried for witchcraft, sorcery, heresy, and for wearing men's clothing in ruin. The trial lasted several months. The English knew that if they killed her, they would create a martyr. Instead, they wanted to undermine Joan and any influence she had before she died. Prior to her trial, Joan had been treated not unkindly by her captor. During her trial, however, she was treated harshly. Her jailers wouldn't permit her to attend mass before her trial, one of the only things she begged for. Due to her past record of escape attempts, she was also tied to a wooden block and under watchful eyes at all times. Joan was questioned about Charles, but she steadfastly refused to answer any questions about him. The demands and accusations continued, but Joan's responses were so skillfully evasive that they only served to infuriate the English even more. In the end, all but 12 of the charges were dropped. During her trial, Joan was asked if she was in God's grace, and she replied, If I am not, may God put me there, and if I am, may God so keep me. The trial drew to a close and her sentence was delivered on May 24, 1431. She was to be turned over to the Burgundians and the English. Joan begged for an appeal, but the Pope refused her. Terrified of what her fate would be if she reached the hands of the Burgundians and the English, Joan signed an abjuration. This action infuriated her accusers, as now that Joan had admitted to her guilt, she was protected under the church. She was thrown into prison for an indefinite stay when the voices visited her again and told Joan that signing the abjuration had been a mistake. Calling this action a relapse, Joan was handed over to the Burgundians and the English on May 29th. Upon discovering her planned method of execution, Joan was horror-stricken. She pleaded with her jailers, telling them that she would rather be beheaded than burned alive. They took no notice, and her pleas went unanswered. One of the soldiers took pity on her and gave her a hastily made wooden cross. She kissed it before concealing it to her bosom. Even during her death, Joan had made no attempts to deny that the voices of the divine had spoken to her. Her final word was Jesus. Many people question the contradiction of Joan of Arc. There are a series of accounts of her persecution, though historians have different views on her being. To this day, there is no physical proof of Joan of Arc's existence, and if she heard direct messages from God. If she didn't, how did she know how to lead France to victory? Many people see this event in history as validation of God. Joan's legacy and prevalence remain evident even today. As of now, scientists and philosophers alike are dedicating their lives to unraveling the enigma that is Joan of Arc. During a time period where women could and were killed for daring to presume that they were as worthy as men and deserved to fight in the army, Joan changed that mold by proving that she was just as good as any man. She showed the world that you don't have to be a male to defend what you believe in. While she was an invaluable commander and advisor during her trial and imprisonment, she also remained steadfast and resolute in her beliefs. After Joan's death, the tide turned drastically against the English. The majority of the king's advisors were against making peace, and though the war continued for another several years, it drew to an unofficial close on July 17, 1453. After the English were driven from Rouen in November of 1449, Joan's case was brought back for appeal. An inquisitor named Jean Brawl claimed that Joan had been convicted illegally and without enough basis to create a solid case against her. She was described as a martyr and was eventually given beatification in 1909. Joan was sainted in 1920, and during World War I, the French army would pray to her while on the battlefield for strength, courage, and protection. Even authors remained enraptured with her, Mark Twain perhaps being one of the most notable. Twain's fascination with the Maid of Orleans remains perhaps one of the greatest conundrums of literary history. He wrote a novel about her from the point of view of one of her soldiers. This work of literature remains proof of how firmly the story of Joan of Arc can reside in the minds of the curious. Though she was committed, she changed the way history thinks of women and the way women think of themselves. Joan was the person who proved that the stereotypes and molds that we've placed on each other in our society are restrictive and that sometimes all it takes is one person to change the world.